If you open your Bibles with me to the next portion, a passage in the fifth chapter of Galatians. This is one of those passages where it's very um, cumbersome and um, dark to consider. Before we get to the sunshine of verse 22 and verse 23, where you have the fruit of the Spirit, which will lift us up, we have to plow through the muck and mire of verses 19 through 21, which describes the way life is without Jesus. The way life is without God. The way life is without the Bible. The way life is without salvation. When society says, we don't want God, we don't want scripture, we don't want churches, we don't want preachers. Then what we're about to read is what you get. When you say that. And that's true of a life. I've actually met people who, who, who said to me, I don't want God to bother me and I won't bother him. And I said, you know, you don't know what you're asking for. We have seen in the previous few verses leading up to verse 19, that even in the experience of the regenerate, the redeemed, There is still a battle going on internally. In the words of verse 16. Having said walk by the spirit. And in so doing you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Then verse 17 speaks of this conflict. The flesh sets its intense desire against the Holy Spirit. There is something within Every sinner that is in conflict at war with God. In the words of Romans 5, there's enmity with God. What is that? That's the flesh. And that that doesn't mean your skin or your bones or your muscles or your nerves. That... This is a word, the word flesh that's used here means that part of your inner life that is lost, that is unredeemed. But verse 17 says the spirit has great desire against the flesh. The Holy Spirit doesn't give in to that. There's a conflict going on. Do you ever feel that brothers and sisters in Christ? In the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, that which I don't want to do, I find myself doing. And that which I know I ought to do, I I don't do. And there's this thing going on inside of me. By the way, I hope to say this several times today. You know what that means? That means you're saved. You mean if there's a conflict going on, I'm saved? Yeah. Because if you weren't saved, you wouldn't fight. You just give in to the flesh. Something worth thinking about. Verse 19. Here's what happens if the flesh wins. Now, verse 19, the deeds of the flesh are evident. The word deeds, the word works. This is what the flesh manifests. If the flesh takes over a life, this is what shows up. If the flesh takes over society, this is what shows up. The deeds of the flesh are evident. Now I'm reading the NASB translating are evident. It means obvious. By the way, I think this is an incredible statement. The Bible is saying you should know these things are the deeds of the flesh. You should know these are wrong things. But what happens if people who live by the flesh get to the point where they no longer see this as obvious? It's a dark and desperate place to be, isn't it? This is obvious. These things are clear. They're self-evidential. The deeds of the flesh, which are, and then he lists 15 things. 
this could be a 15-point sermon. We'll walk through them in just a moment. Let me read them. Immorality. Impurity. Sensuality. Idolatry. Sorcery. Enmities. Strife. Jealousy. Outbursts of anger. Disputes. Dissensions. Factions. Envying. Drunkenness. Carousings. And then he adds in verse 21, things like these. In other words, this isn't the whole list. (laughs) There's a whole bunch more that we didn't even put on here. But anything that falls into this, these kind of categories can be included. And then notice the rest of verse 21. Of which I forewarn you. Just as I have forewarned you. He says, I I told you before. I warned you about this. I'm telling you again. He's consistent. He hasn't changed his views. What is he forewarning them about? Look at the end of verse 21. That those who practice. That's a key word. Those who practice. Such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. No qualification. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The text is really simple to outline. There are two things, two parts. First, in verse 19... Through the first part of verse 21, we have what I'll choose to call a description of the flesh as seen through the deeds of the flesh. In other words, the flesh, the internal flesh itself, this unsaved uh, part of the sinner person is seen in the stuff it produces And this is described. Then at the end of verse 21. He condemns. The flesh. First the flesh described. Second the flesh condemned. Let's look at the description. The description of the flesh. And its deeds. Are found in these 15 terms. Now I want to walk through them briefly. We won't spend long with each one. Some of them appear to be. Uh, synonyms of each other. And I think of these as those that appear to be synonymous as overlapping terms. And they, they do two things. One is they reiterate what he's saying and they add maybe a little bit to it so we get a fuller picture of what he's talking about. For example, verse 19, immorality. The word is pornea. Obviously, we get our word pornography From this word pornea. It's a Greek word that means sexual immorality. Sexual behavior that is not affirmed or approved by God. And and anybody, really the children, the young people need to find out at church that God gave sexuality. And it needs to be regulated by God's teaching. This is where you need to hear that. Not in a pagan society that rejects God's law regarding sexuality. You can behave in a way sexually that is immoral in the eyes of God. He speaks of that a lot. 1 Corinthians 6.13, Ephesians 5.3, Revelation 19 verse 2. And even the passage that I read earlier talks about that. 2 Corinthians 12. Verses 20 and 21. He adds to that in verse 19 of our passage. Impurity. 
This is the word for uncleanness. This means that you are unclean in the eyes of God. He uses this in other places as well. Romans 6, 19, 2 Corinthians 12. Again, he adds to that a third word in verse 19. The word sensuality, which can be also translated indecency. It literally means living for the pleasure of your body. Whatever your body says feels good, that's how you live. As a friend of mine years ago called it, that's living by the glands. Especially in sexuality. So you have three words that hit this part. Immorality, impurity, sensuality. There is no question but that God states clearly in his word, both in Old and New Testaments, repeatedly that sexuality ought to be regulated by his word. I just give it to you. You need to, if you want to know the truth, read the word of God. He's very plain. He's very clear. And he repeats himself a lot on this subject because he wants us to get it. But he adds to that something that we might find surprising He adds in verse 20 the word idolatry. And I get the feeling with a lot of people that that they they don't think idolatry is a problem of today. Because you don't have little stone gods on your mantle or on your car dash. Idolatry is anything that takes the place of God in our lives. Any idea? Any love? You can love someone so much... That it takes the place of your love for God. That's idolatry. You can believe an idea. In place of God's word. That is idolatry. Anytime you take God. Or what God says. And remove him or it. And replace it with something else. That's idolatry. We are idolaters today. No question about it. And it is a deed of the flesh. He adds to that an interesting word. The word sorcery. The word is pharmakia. Obviously, you hear the word pharmacy. Because it has to do with drug use and ancient sorcery, alchemy, magical arts. It's interesting that Paul, in writing here, does not deny that sorcery exists. You look in Exodus chapter 22 and various places in the Pentateuch throughout it talks about this idea of magical arts that use drugs in an attempt to contact or be engaged with the spiritual world in an inappropriate and unapproved way this is sorcery sorcery is growing in our own day anytime you find someone who is teaching some spirituality Or some philosophy or ideology that explains what's out there other than what's found in the Bible is dabbling in some aspect of sorcery. It is growing. It is consuming our culture. Soon, I believe, our society will embrace it. This is the big deception. And those who do not believe in this... Uh, description or narrative of ultimate reality that seeks to explain all that is will be considered either disobedient or treacherous or stupid. Sorcery. He adds to that some words that I find rather disturbing in my own life. Enmities. Verse 20. Enmities. The King James translates that hatred. It's a bad feeling between people who don't get along. You can put the word enemy there in, instead of enmities. Enemies, hostility. Romans 5.10 uses that word that's translated enemies of God. <clears throat> So here you have a a beginning of a description of terms that help us understand that there can be no peace, there can be no unity, there can be no harmony, there can be no getting along when the flesh is in control. And it, it, 
If it wasn't so serious, it'd be laughable that we're hearing so much today about let's be unified. And it's being given to us by people who are following the flesh. You can't be unified in that way. He adds to that the word strife. The word strife means quarreling, contentious, a desire for disputation. (laughs) That means just love to fuss with people, to argue with people. He adds to that the word jealousy. Now, the word jealousy, the word translated uh, jealousy, could be a good word or a bad word, zealous. It it means zeal. Uh, It can be a strong feeling against others. And I think that's how it's used here. He adds to that outburst of anger. Outburst of anger. Anger is... Anger is a description of the flesh. <clears throat> Outburst. Short temper. Boom. Without control. It means fits of rage. <clears throat> he adds to that disputes. This is a word that's similar to the word given strife. Meaning tendency to argue, it's factious, it's self-seeking, it's selfish, factious, disputing. He adds to that word dissensions. I find this interesting. The word dissension, the flesh, deeds of the flesh creates dissensions. Literally the word means to stand apart from others. Again, no unity. But disunity, the people who hate our country want to destabilize our country. The people who hate the kingdom of God and the church of Jesus want to divide them, divide us, to stand apart from each other. He adds to that factions. Interestingly enough, the word factions, last word in verse 20. The King James translates that heresies, as indeed 2 Peter 2.1 uses it. It means being opinionated with discord and to become cliquish, dividing into groups and rejecting others who don't fit into our group. That's the deed of the flesh. Three more. Verse 21, envying. Meaning to hold a grudge, to long for what another has, to hold bitterness against someone else is a deed of the flesh. Satan wants to poke your flesh and make you uh, continue to hate other people or to be upset about other people because they have something you don't have. Two words that go together well are the final two words. And Paul will use those words together in other uh, texts. Drunkenness and carousing. Drunkenness, out of control because of intoxication. Drunkenness was common in the ancient world. And these believers had come out of a culture that allowed, indeed, elevated drunkenness. They thought it was fun. But Christians should not be drunk. And Ephesians 5, we're told to be not be drunk with wine, we're in his excess, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In contrast to that, the word carousing means lack of discipline and propriety. Wow. We don't understand what's appropriate anymore. We say anything, we use any word we want. Let me read another passage at the end of this list before we go to the condemnation part. Romans 13 Paul, when saying uh, to us, uh, know the time in which you live. It's time to wake up from sleep. Salvation's nearer than when we believe. The night's almost gone. The day is at hand. Lay aside the deeds of darkness. Put on the armor of light, he writes. And then he says this. Let us behave properly. As in the daytime. Not in carousing and drunkenness. Those are those two words together. 
not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh with regard to its lust. If I were to summarize these 15 deeds of the flesh, I would categorize them in the following way. Number one, the deeds of the flesh are sexual sins that disobey God in all aspects of his regulation of human sexuality. Two, they are sins of attitude and perspective, both of God and of others, that allow, indeed, inspire hatred for others, disregard for others, anger toward others as social sins because the flesh is selfish. Three, there are sins of undisciplined behavior. God doesn't want you to just let her rip. He wants you to control yourself. Discipline yourself. Sins of excess are condemned. And finally, sins of idolatry against God. All of these other sins include a hatred of God. A rejection of God. A turning from God. William Perkins the Puritan said, These vices described here mirror the corruption in our own hearts. Now it appears that, that the lid is off of society. And all of these sins that were in the human heart are belching out. And this is not even an exhaustive list. He says anything like these sins can be included. Any behavior, any thought, any speech that comes from an unsaved mind and heart that contradicts the clear teaching of Scripture that is in rebellion against God, that serves and worships self, anything that looks at people as people to be used and not to be loved and cared for, these things are deeds of the flesh. Description of the deeds of the flesh describes the flesh itself. Then the second category of our text is, let's consider what he says about the condemnation of the flesh. And let me simply say, as we go back to verse 21 of our text, God means just what he says. And he says just what he means. I've, I've heard people say, oh, my God wouldn't judge. Wait a minute. Are you saying you, you want a God you can describe or the God who is? Moses got it from God, didn't he? God said, I am that I am. Don't try to mold me into one of your little idols. I'll be who I am. Notice again the condemnation of the flesh. Listen carefully. Paul says in verse 21 of Galatians 5, I, I forewarned you, I forewarned you about this before, and I forewarn you again. And here was his warning. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Two important points. One, he is describing people not who sin, but whose lives are controlled by sin. Christians sin. I'm looking here at a bunch of people who sinned this week. Oh, he knows what I did. I don't have to know what you did. I just know you sinned. But you're looking at a guy who sinned this week. We still sin. But there are phenomenal differences now. First, we hate our sin. Do you love your sin? If you say, oh, yeah, it doesn't bother me a bit, let's talk. I want to introduce you to Jesus. Because anyone who is saved doesn't love their sin. They don't like their sin. They hate their sin. They hate what their sin does to themselves and what their sin does to others and what their sin does to God. They want to change. They want to be perfect. We can't be, but we want to be. And if that's not in your heart, then how is it you're a new creature in Christ? How is it that you're born again? No, he's talking about people who practice, 
according to NASB, who practice these things. They live this way. They get up in the morning thinking like this. They go to bed at night thinking like this. This is how they think all day. That's just who they are. It's interesting, the teaching of the New Testament describes sin as being something that incrementally grips you. The more you sin, the more you want to sin. The more you sin, the more sin holds you until you get to a point where your sin has you. And you cannot say no to it. You are dominated. Let's use the word addicted to sin. I have a word for you in just a moment that I think you'll like. He not only says this is about people who practice these things, but here is the condemnation. People who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The New Testament does not teach universalism. I've gone to so many funerals. Where I knew or I had a real good hunch the deceased was unsaved. And man, people just preached them into heaven. So much so that the only thing most people think it takes to go to heaven is to simply die. This text, among others, say if your life is morally flawed to the degree that is described here... That means you are not a Christian. You say, I don't like that. I don't care whether you like it or not. I'm telling you what this is saying. You take it up with God. If your life is dominated by these sins. These sins control your mind, your life. You are not a believer. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. There are two aspects of the kingdom of God. I believe that are in view here. One is the kingdom in the soul. We are born again. We are now people of the kingdom. You don't have the new birth. And two is the ultimate destiny and the fulfillment of kingdom. And that would be heaven. Application. A few thoughts before I close with some very important things to say. Application. I said it before, I'll say it again. Please hear me. This passage is telling us. And we're now, when we come back next week, if the Lord wills, and we get back here and everything works well, we're going to see the fruit of the Spirit. And you're going to see the contrast between what God, through His Spirit, births in a believer's life with the deeds of the flesh. These are greatly different. If we reject the God of light... If we reject the light of God, then by necessity and inevitability, we will have darkness and we deserve it. I wish I could spend the time to talk to you about where I think how that applies to our country. If we have said no, 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 no to God. Then he will say Okay, have your sin. Let's see what happens. And you and I know what will happen. James tells us, sin conceived or lust conceived brings forth sin. Sin, when it's matured, brings forth death. You cannot avoid darkness when you don't have light. Second application is simply this. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm speaking to us here. We cannot live immoral lives if we're saved for an immoral life means we're not saved and I've heard people say I've prayed the prayer God is going to punish evangelicals who've told people for years if you pray the prayer you're saved if your life doesn't back up I prayed a prayer and I got saved But I got saved not because I prayed a prayer. I got saved because the Holy Spirit was working on my heart and brought me to Jesus. And I prayed. (laughs) But if your life doesn't show that you're saved, you're not saved. (laughs) Stop giving people assurance who are living like the devil. 
Third application. This passage in context reminds us that we as saved people, in contrast to the fleshly life, must walk in the Spirit. We're told that in verse 16. We must live by the Spirit. In verse 25, as we walk in the Spirit, we live by the Spirit. We must be the people of Christ. We must pursue Christ and His Lordship. We must pursue His Word. We must pursue the teaching of the Scripture. We must long humbly. We must confess our sins and long for God to make us more and more like Jesus Christ. And we will do that in a culture that is soaked in sinfulness. And we're going to stand out. Which brings me to a question. How can a Christian live in an unchristian culture? Let me suggest some things. First, Christian, make sure that you have established Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. Make sure you're saved. Then study the scripture and conform your beliefs and your morality not to Dr. So-and-so, but to the word of God, the scripture. And wherever Dr. So-and-so disagrees with the Bible, I urge you, go with the Bible. Or your favorite preacher on TV or whatever. It is the word of God. Connect your life to a biblical and godly church family. I can't urge this more enough to you today. It is vital in these days and in the days to come. I see a day coming when it is going to be a necessity for Christians to be in a godly biblical church. That's why churches need to be godly and biblical for people who want that to join. Christian, watch out for ungodly friendships and ungodly people. It doesn't mean you can't have coffee with a lost person to share Christ with them. But when you form your friendships and your social bonds, make sure you're not binding yourself to people or groups of people who will influence you away from Jesus Christ. It's called being unequally yoked. And Christian, realize that you're fighting not against just them, but what's in you. Your flesh. God has not eradicated your sinful flesh in your heart yet. It is not to say that you can't have victory in your life. You can. The Holy Spirit is present. The word of God is real. The grace of God is active to bring the power of God to the place of our weakness. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12. But you and I must fight like crazy. The word he uses Paul uses in Romans is mortify. He says mortify the flesh. Mortify. We don't use that word anymore. It means go to battle with everything you've got. And know this. And I, if I've had this asked me once, I've had it asked 120 times. I must not be saved, pastor, because I, I have sin that I'm fighting with in my life. And I said, oh, brother, oh, sister, the only reason you're fighting is because you are saved. Fight well, fight hard, continue on, endure, pray, read the word, trust in Christ, give it all you've got. The words of Philippians 2, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You'll never be done with this battle until you die. Oh, thanks, that's encouraging. The battle changes as you grow older, perhaps. Or as life changes, the battle may change. But you will fight with the flesh, with selfishness, with wrong thinking until this very day when God takes you home. Remember always Jesus died for you. You are forgiven in Christ and your joy will be found in the beauties of Christ made evident to your soul. Now, conclusion. A couple of things that I need to say in closing. First, the church in our modern era, and very likely many Christians and Christian families, will face pressure, increasing pressure in the days to come. 
by people they love. Pressuring them to capitulate in this matter of sin, its nature, and meaning. I know families today who have people in their family who are used by the devil to try to get them to compromise the truth. This is a great pressure when someone we really care about is living in sin. Can we say, thus saith the Lord? Or do we give in and give up? As Christians give in, as families in the church give in, they will put pressure on the church to give in until one day there will be very few churches who will hold to this teaching. It's happening right now. It's happening in denominations right now. Every church must come to the point where we confess no matter what, That the Bible is true in everything it teaches. And where the culture disagrees with the word of God and our loved ones. We will stand with God. And we will not capitulate to their sensibilities. That may cost us much. And yet if we don't do it. What will we say to God when we meet him? I have a final word. That's a word of hope. I said I was going to give you a a good word later. This is it. So perk up. What I'm about to say. I believe ever as much as anything else I've said up to this point. I believe. That your life. No matter how much. You have been dominated by sin. No much how, no much how, no, uh, no ma- matter how much sin has gotten a grip in your heart and life, no matter how far you've fallen, Jesus Christ can save you. Listen to me. Listen to me. Before you sin, the devil says it's no big deal. After you sin, he says, you dirty rat, God can't save you. Both are lies. It is a big deal, and he can save you. I'm talking to somebody right now who thinks in your heart, I've done too much, I've fallen too far. God hates me, and I can't be saved. Please hear me when I say. When you say that, that means the cross of Jesus Christ is not enough for somebody like you. And I want you to know, Jesus' death, his shed blood, are so powerful that they can save someone like me and someone like you. Amen, brothers and sisters. But listen carefully, as we'll find out tonight in pastor time. He'll save you from your sin. He won't save you to go back to your sin. Right? Huh? He'll save you from it. He'll give you a new life. He'll walk you in the light. Come to Jesus. Come to Christ. Come to him who died for sinners just like us. And who rose again the third day in victory. Let us pray. Gracious heavenly father. I pray that you would make this and other churches strong in the truth. And I pray that you would save sinners. Bring them to the end of themselves. Bring them to the vile and ugly place of sin. To see how vile and ugly their sin is. But also bring them to the cross of Jesus Christ. And make them to understand. That they can be saved. They can be transformed. They can be born again. By the power of your spirit. In keeping with your will. For your glory and honor. They can live lives that honor you. Lord make it happen we pray. In someone's heart today. In Jesus name we ask.